Thank you for inviting me. Um, what I contended in the article that got me invited here was that one of the biggest taboos in the United States, one of the behaviors treated most as a heresy, as a violation of national religion, is disrespect for the US flag, the national anthem, and the patriotic militarist exceptionalism that accompany these icons. We've just seen a school shooting in Florida by a young man trained to shoot by the US Army in the very school where he killed his classmates. And you will find virtual silence about that fact. And the silence is self-imposed. Mm -hmm. Veterans are over twice as likely, statistically, to be mass shooters. And you will not read that in any newspaper. And needless to say, that is not somehow grounds for engaging in bigotry toward veterans or for foregoing obvious solutions like banning guns. Progressive, multi-issue activist coalitions are formed constantly in this country, the Climate March, the Women's March, etc. And although the military is the top consumer of petroleum, although it sucks down 60% of the funding that Congress votes on, although it endangers us, erodes our liberties, and militarizes our police and our schools, it goes unmentioned. Foreign policy is unquestionable. Socialism includes no internationalism today. So there's something very remarkable about demonstrating against racist police violence by departing from the mandatory body position during the national anthem. It garners attention because it is so very unusual. And this is uniquely American. Many other countries reserve flags for anthems, the flags and anthems for international competitions and major occasions, not every adult or child sporting event. In much of the world, if you even see any flag, you can ignore it without being suspended from school or shut out of your sports career. Kids have been suspended from US schools for taking a knee, as well as for refusing the Pledge of Allegiance. Colin Kaepernick is unemployed. The US president wants those who take a knee fired for, quote, disrespecting our flag. And that is a step up from the pastor in Alabama who wants anyone who takes a knee to be shot. But the US Vice President feels entitled to refuse to stand for a flag of Korean unity despite the obvious passion for it of tens of thousands of people around him. Flag Day was created by President Woodrow Wilson on the birthday of the US Army during the propaganda campaign leading up to World War I. To my knowledge, there are only two countries on Earth that regularly recite a pledge to a flag. The original stiff arm salute that they made in the US was changed to a hand over the heart after a straight arm became associated with Nazism. Nowadays, visitors from abroad are often shocked to see US children instructed to stand and robotically chant an oath of obedience to a piece of colored cloth. US families who lose the loved one in war are presented with a flag instead. A majority of Americans support criminalizing the burning of a US flag. The US flag appears on Catholic altars in some states, as well as other churches and sacred arenas. Texas, with its own national war-making history, may be an exception, but for the most part, people do not treat local or state or UN or world flags as sacred. It is exclusively the flag that accompanies a military that must be worshiped, a military that pays the NFL millions of public dollars to perform pro-military ceremonies. At least some of the players taking a knee will certainly tell you that they love the flag and the troops and the wars. I have absolutely no interest in pretending to speak for them. They speak very well for themselves. But I am appreciative, whether they like it or not, of their willingness to protest racism by challenging flag worship. I think this is a benefit to both freedom of speech and freedom of religion. After all, freedom of religion rests fundamentally on the ability to refrain from engaging in sacred rituals. Have you listened carefully or read the full lyrics to the US National Anthem? The third verse celebrates killing people who had just escaped from slavery. An earlier version had celebrated killing Muslims. The lyricist himself, Francis Scott Key, owned people as slaves and supported lawless police killings of African Americans. Strip its song down to its first verse, and it remains a celebration of war, of the mass killing of human beings, of a war of conquest that failed to take over Canada, but did get the White House burned, 
And during the course of that valorous piece of blood-soaked stupidity, he witnessed a battle in which human beings died, but a flag survived. And I'm supposed to stand like an obedient, mindless robot and worship that glorious incident. And it's supposed to matter what I do with my hand, but not what I do with my brain. I take that back. I am expected to switch my brain onto low power mode in order to take seriously claims to the effect that militarism protects my freedom and that I should therefore give up some of my freedom for it. Before the US attacked Iraq in 2003, the CIA said the only case in which Iraq is likely to use any of its vast new stockpiles of weapons of mass destruction is if Iraq is attacked. Apart from the non-existence of those weapons, that was right. The same applies to North Korea. But if North Korea were able to, and did, launch a missile at the United States, that would still not somehow constitute a threat to your freedoms. In particular, it would be a threat to your life. With the age of conquest and colonization gone for three quarters of a century, and with numbers suggesting that North Korea would need more than its entire population in order to occupy the United States, the chances that North Korea is a threat to your freedom are exactly zero. But the bombing of Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, Somalia, Pakistan, Libya, and the threats to North Korea, Iran, etc., are generating a lot more enemies than they kill. So the threat to your life is real. Although the threat to your life posed by automobiles, toddlers with guns, and dozens of other dangers is greater. And the militarism strips away freedoms in the name of protecting them. Recent wars have brought us warrantless surveillance, drones in the skies, lawless imprisonment, mass deportations, expanded government secrecy, whistleblowers imprisoned, public demonstrations contained in cages, metal detectors and cameras everywhere, inauguration protesters facing felony charges, and various powers moving from the Congress to the White House. A couple of weeks ago, I did a public debate with a professor of ethics from West Point on whether war is ever justifiable. The video is at davidswanson.org. I argued that not only can no war possibly meet the criteria of just war theory, but if one war could, it would have to do so much good as to outweigh all the damage done by keeping the institution of war around, including the risk of nuclear apocalypse, including the death and suffering far greater than in all of the wars that's created by the diversion of resources away from human and environmental needs. 3% of US military spending, for example, could end starvation globally. While I do not get enough minutes here to make the case for war abolition, I bring it up to make the following point. If you view war as an outdated institution, then you want to help everyone engaged in it to transition out of it. Did you know the US is the only nation on Earth that has not ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which forbids military recruitment of children? and that the US military describes that JROTC, as in that school in Florida, as a recruitment program. The propaganda technique of claiming that if you oppose a war, you favor the other side in the war, and that if you oppose flag worship, you hate the troops who make up the US military, falls apart when you oppose all war making, and when you support only those enemies in the eyes of the Pentagon that threaten rather than boost its recruitment, namely, free college, free health care, good schools, general social benefits available to countries that don't dump their treasuries into militarism. Mine are not the positions of a traitor, an insult I'm not really fond of, nor are they the positions of a so-called true patriot, a compliment I'm also not fond of. Patriotism is a problem. We don't need to make America great or declare it already great. We need to recognize the greatness of our entire own and many other species on this fragile little planet. Kaepernick said, quote, I am not going to stand up to show pride in a flag for a country that oppresses black people and people of color. Of course, a country has millions of flaws and of achievements. I propose not feeling pride or shame or identifying with a country or a national government at all. I propose identifying with humanity and with smaller communities. I also propose taking notice of the fact that the United States now bombs several nations at a time, none of which contain primarily people labeled white. Quote, why should they ask me, said Muhammad Ali, 
To put on a uniform and go 10,000 miles from home and drop bombs and bullets on brown people in Vietnam while so-called Negro people in Louisville are treated like dogs and denied simple human rights. Why should they ask you even if people in Louisville were treated well? Protesting racist violence but not militarism is a million miles better than nothing, but it is still a major failure to protest all racist violence. Dr. King said we needed to take on racism, militarism, and extreme materialism together. He spoke the truth. In a lyric that was sung at the opening ceremonies at the Olympics, John Lennon advised, imagine there are no countries. It isn't hard to do. He lied. For most people, it is very, very hard to do. But it is something I believe we need to work on urgently and accomplish. And thank you for inviting me here.